What's going on, y'all? It's your man, Supreme, and welcome back to The Real Rap Show. And this is episode 32 of The Real Rap Show, the story of Kenneth Supreme McGriff and the Supreme Team. Now, y'all know the vibes already. Before we get this episode started, I would like to say thank you to everyone who has been giving me great feedback about the show. Everyone who has been donating to the channel, all the new subscribers, and also thank you to everyone who has been tuning into the show since day one. I thank y'all for y'all support. Now let's get this started. In the early 80s on the streets of Southside Jamaica, Queens, Kenneth McGriff started out as a member of the 5% Nation Guards and Earths. This was the early 80s, Southside Jamaica, Queens. It was a lot of dudes getting a lot of money. A lot of dudes were starting their way into the game to become drug kingpins. And also, the younger dudes that was coming up looked up to that lifestyle and they wanted to be like these dudes. They wanted the attention from the girls, the jewelry, the money, the power. And also, at this time, it was real easy to get into the game. So, with him being a member of the 5% Nation, they gave him the name Supreme. And in the neighborhood, Supreme had a little crew of guys that he was teaching the 5% lessons to so these little guys could have knowledge of self and could become members of the 5% Nation. They was under him being that he was giving them the lessons. Supreme titled his little crew the Supreme Team. The year is 1985. And the Supreme Team is now in the drug game, selling little nickels and dimes on the streets of Southside Jamaica, Queens. Supreme and his crew began getting so much money off the drug game, he purchased a bulletproof 500 Mercedes Benz. And that's what he would drive around Queens in with members of the Supreme Team. But there was another dude in Queens who was really, really getting money. And this is the dude who Kenneth Supreme McGriff was getting his drugs from to sell on the streets. And this man goes by the name of Lorenzo Fat Cat Nichols. Now, Fat Cat is the Supreme Team's main supplier. And I will be covering the Lorenzo Fat Cat Nichols story in a future episode. In 1985, the feds arrest Lorenzo Fat Cat Nichols on drug conspiracy and weapons charges. After Fat Cat got locked up, Supreme and his crew was making two to three hundred thousand dollars a day off selling crack on the streets of Queens. I want to make a special dedication to my man, my brother, who ain't with us right now, he with us in heart and mind. But in 1987, Supreme and some members of the Supreme team are arrested and indicted on drug charges. Now, even with Supreme being the ringleader of this whole organization, he only gets 10 years in prison. While Supreme is serving his 10-year bid, there are still members of the Supreme team that are left on the streets of Queens. The person that took over the crew while Supreme was inside was a guy by the name of Gerald Prince Miller. And this dude Prince didn't tolerate nothing. People started to wind up dead on the streets of Queens. The feds knew about a total of eight people that were killed by the Supreme team while Gerald Prince Miller was in charge while Supreme was doing his 10-year bid. Hold on, let me take the story back a little bit for y'all. In 1985, Fat Cat was already on the Fed's radar. I don't know for what reason, but they wanted him. They also knew that Fat Cat was on parole. So one day, Fat Cat goes in to see his PO, whose name is Brian Rooney. And when Fat Cat goes to see his PO, he's arrested for violating his parole and is sent back to jail to finish a 14-year sentence. So now, Fat Cat is locked up furious behind his parole officer violating them and throwing them back in jail because there is no way out of this you have to finish the 14 years a few days later parole officer brian rooney was leaving work with a co-worker that he was dropping off somewhere before he went home for the night 
Shortly after dropping off the person, parole officer Brian Rooney was headed home when two dudes in a vehicle rolled up right next to his car, pulled out guns and opened fire on his vehicle, killing Officer Rooney. While Supreme was locked up, once again, the feds knew about a total of eight murders that the Supreme team was involved in, but they didn't charge Supreme with those murders even though they knew he was the leader of the crew, he wasn't charged because he was already incarcerated at that time. This is 1987. Now, after what happened to the parole officer on Sutphin Boulevard, the police in Queens are now on a sweep and they're snatching up everybody, every little organization in the neighborhood trying to get people to talk so they can find out who did this to parole officer Rooney. During the suite, one day police run up on a member of the Supreme team who goes by the name of Pappy Mason. They throw Pappy Mason up against the wall and they search him and they find a 22 Dillinger pistol hidden inside of his boot. Pappy Mason is then arrested. Pappy Mason, real short tempered, didn't tolerate anything kind of guy. On the streets of South Jamaica, Queens, he was known to shoot you stab you, whatever, in a heartbeat and wouldn't think anything of it. That's what kind of dude Pappy Mason was. But the police's main objective was to find out who did this to the parole officer. Now, Pappy Mason is on Rikers Island and he's mad because Pappy Mason felt like the police shouldn't have stopped him. He shouldn't have been arrested. And like I said, Pappy Mason was the kind of guy that didn't tolerate anything, no kind of disrespect whatsoever. So Pappy Mason felt like the police targeted him and that they did him wrong and he wasn't supposed to be in jail and he was mad because of that. So while on Rikers Island, Pappy Mason called to the streets of Queens and told his boys to violate any police that y'all see on the block. There was an old Guyanese man named Arjun that lived on 107th Avenue and Inwood Street in South Jamaica, Queens. Now, Arjun was a working man who wanted to stand up against the drug dealers on his block. He would constantly call the cops and make complaints about the drug dealers that was in front of his house and on the block. Well, the dealers on the block happened to find out that Arjun is the person making the complaints, sending the police to the block. One night while Arjun was sitting in his living room on the couch watching TV, someone threw a Molotov cocktail through Arjun's living room window, setting his living room on fire. Arjun was not injured in the attack, but the attack was a warning from the dealers outside to let Arjun know that they knew that he was the person calling the police on them. After the firebombing, one day, one of the dealers spotted Arjun getting into his car, leaving work. He approaches Arjun's car and threatens him and tells Arjun that him and his family have a week to get out of the neighborhood. Arjun then contacts the police. To protect Arjun, police from the 103rd Precinct assigned 22-year-old rookie cop Edward Byrne to patrol Arjun's block and make sure he's safe. Let's take the story back a little bit. Remember when Pappy Mason called from Rikers Island and told his homeboys on the streets to violate the first police that they see on the block? On February 26, 1988, on 107th Avenue and Inwood Street at around 3 o'clock in the morning, Officer Burns was sitting in his patrol car reading a book when a car with four dudes in it pulled up beside his car. Two dudes got out the car and one of them knocked on his passenger side window. When Officer Burns turns to see what he wants, another dude crept around to the driver's side. And while Officer Burns was talking, the dude on the driver's side shoots Officer Burns in the head five times, killing him. The other two dudes was holding them down as lookouts as these two dudes just did this. The killing of Officer Burns sparked one of the biggest drug sweeps in New York history after the President of the United States, who was George Bush at the time, got on national TV 
and had Officer Burns' badge in his hand. And he said, we are going to get whoever is responsible for the murder of this young man. Now, tear those comments up. Because if you a person that's from that era and you from Queens, then you would know that after George Bush got on TV and said that with that officer's badge in his hand, the police went crazy in Queens. So the feds knew that there was only two people powerful enough to have something like this done. And those two people were the two people that were already in custody. And those people were Pappy Mason and Lorenzo Fat Cat Nichols. So the first person that the feds started looking into was Lorenzo Fat Cat Nichols. So what the feds do is they obtain Fat Cat's phone call records from prison to find out who is he calling the most. And it comes to find out as big as this guy is on the street, the only person he seems to be contacting is his sister. So the feds wiretap Fat Cat's sister's house phone. And in the process of the feds trying to find out if Fat Cat set up the killing of Officer Byrne, they find out that Fat Cat's sister is helping him run his drug operation. What was funny about Fat Cat's sister, the feds said that when Fat Cat would call, she would always say, I feel like my phone is being tapped. Don't say anything. But in the next breath, she would start blurbing out freely on the phone about everything that was going on. The drugs, who was coming to get it, how much money was being made, everything. I want to stop the story for a minute because you know what's funny about this? If you from the street and you listening to me right now, what I'm about to say, you probably can relate to this. You ever been on the phone with somebody and the person that you're on the phone with go, I ain't gonna talk too crazy over the phone, but you heard what happened, right? And you go, yeah, I heard what happened, but what went down with that? And then the person that just said he not gonna talk too crazy over the phone, he ends up going, yeah, you heard so-and-so did that. Yo, bro, you just said you not, you just gave away the person that the police is looking for. So what was the whole purpose of you saying you not gonna talk crazy over the phone? I just had to bring that up because I've been on the phone with people like that and I would hang the phone up and go, damn. Well, you just told me on the phone that you wasn't going to talk crazy over the phone about it. But at the end of the conversation, you end up giving away the person that actually did it and more. So that's how Fat Cat's sister was. This dude, Fat Cat, would call his sister's house sometimes two, three times a day, every day. And his sister would get on the phone. And like I said, she would say, don't talk crazy on the phone because I think my line is tapped. But she would go right ahead and forget she even said that and blab about everything that went on that day and everything else. They also found out through Fat Cat's sister who set up the killing of Officer Byrne. When Fat Cat's sister asked him on the phone, why did Pappy Mason have them dudes go out there and do that? And that the neighborhood was hot and that you couldn't get no money on the streets behind him having them dudes go out there and kill that cop. Soon after, the four dudes who killed Officer Byrne is arrested and charged for the murder. And Pappy Mason is also charged for setting it up from the inside. One of the four men in the Officer Burns case confesses to the feds that he has information on the Brian Rooney case. He then confesses and tells the feds that Pappy Mason and another dude is who killed Parole Officer Brian Rooney. Lorenzo Fat Cat Nichols put a hit out on his parole officer because he thought that if his parole officer wasn't alive anymore, Somehow his case would get overturned and he would get out of jail and wouldn't have to serve the 14 year sentence. For the killing of parole officer Brian Rooney and running a continuous drug enterprise from the insides of the federal penitentiary, Lorenzo Fat Cat Nichols was given life without parole and sent to Florence, Colorado's ADX Maximum Security Prison. And for setting up the murder of rookie cop Edward Byrne, Pappy Mason also received life without parole and was also sent to Florence, Colorado's ADX Supermax prison for the rest of his life. The shooters received life without parole. The feds arrest Fat Cat's sister and also Fat Cat's mother who I believe the feds say was holding money for Fat Cat. The feds also had Fat Cat's mother on the phone talking with his sister about the drug operation. 
Lorenzo Fat Cat Nichols ended up cooperating with the federal government and he agreed with the feds to plead guilty to all the charges under one condition and that condition would be that his mother be released from prison. The feds agreed and Fat Cat's mother was released. If I'm not mistaken, I think his sister ended up doing like five years or something like that. A decade later, Kenneth Supreme McGriff comes home from federal prison and immediately jumps right back into his old drug dealing days lifestyle and begins selling cocaine again. This time trying to align himself with the now powerful music industry. Supreme teams up with music mogul at the time Irv Gotti who was also from Queens. Irv Gotti was the CEO of one of the most talked about record labels at that time, Murder Inc. Records, where at that time was the home of platinum selling artists Ja Rule and Ashanti. But Supreme ends up getting busted by the feds again for distributing cocaine and also for setting up the murder of a local rapper and stick up kid who went by the name of E Money Bags. Kenneth Supreme McGriff's most famous beef is the one that he had with the rapper 50 Cent, where allegedly he had the rapper 50 Cent shot nine times. Kenneth Supreme McGriff is now at Florence, Colorado's ADX Supermax Prison serving a life sentence. Thank you for watching. It's your man Supreme, and you were just now tuned in to The Real Rap Show, and this was episode 32 of of the real rap show the story of kenneth supreme mcgriff and the supreme team hit that like button if you enjoyed this episode subscribe to the channel and also hit that notification bell so you can stay in tune when new episodes of the real rap show is released y'all stay safe out there